we're very privileged to have Louise Fury, and she's curator of archaeology, and she's going to give you a background and to poisons, and it might give you a new perspective. And um, so I'll pass you on to Louise Fury now. Thank you very much. Now, during the, um, the course of this series, you, you'll hear from an, an entomologist and a botanist and a marine biologist and a land vertebrate um, a specialist here at the museum. Um, but I'm going to talk about something that's slightly different. Um, I'm going to talk about food and our vegetables and how um, they have poisonous ancestors uh, and those foods were changed over time. Um, through various processes uh, so that now we can safely eat our vegetables. Um, so the, the heading of my talk is how to eat poisonous food and the subtitle should be safely. <laughs> so why is a plant poisonous? Um, it has, plants have natural defence mechanisms against predators, um, against herbivores, uh, they might taste bitter and uh, that makes them unattractive uh, to be eaten. And they contain um, chemical compounds such as oxalic acid, um, calcium oxalate and toxic alkaloids. And in the case of our New Zealand karaka, um, it has karakin, which is the poison, um, and tutu has tutum. Uh, the plants often contain small crystals and needle-like crystal structures uh, which can irritate the throat and the digestive tract. And this is an example of these small needle-like um, raphides, we call them. They're actual microfossils. This has been taken uh, with a microscope there. You can't see them with the naked eye, but if you were to eat a plant that had these needles in it, you would certainly feel it in your mouth and um, uh, as it goes down your throat and into the stomach. Um, so these are what we call microfossils, and uh, these small needle-like um, raphides survive in the soil for thousands of years. So when archaeologists come along and they're looking at domestication or what foods people ate at the time the site was occupied, they can look at the soil samples after processing look at them under the microscope and they can um, see if they've got these um, microfossils. And each plant has its own distinctive shape. So why, do, why did people eat food that was bad for them? Um, well, hunger, of course, is the, um, is the main driver, um, but also nutrition. And uh, because food, people learned that food could be altered to make it taste better. So there are toxins in a lot of these um, wild foods um, or even in processed, uh, in, in domesticated foods and they can be neutralized or removed by processing them in different ways. By heating, and that includes steaming, um, such as in an earth oven or a hangi, um, or by boiling. Uh, leaching the vegetable in water and uh, soaking uh, to, to wash out the, the, the poisonous uh, substance is, um, is one method of doing that. Fermentation um, of using uh, bacteria or fungi or uh, yeasts to um, actually change the chemical compound into something that is safer. Um, by grating the food, um, and I'm thinking here of um, plants like breadfruit or taro, um, which, which are grated to increase the surface area that can then be exposed to the water in the cooking pot or the umu. Um, drying, freeze drying is another way of altering the compounds, and geophagy. Now this is, a, this is an interesting one, which is the ingestion of clay. <clears throat> and um, there's some evidence that um, primates um, also use clay to um, bind up the toxins in food that they have eaten. Um, special clays will um, uh, inhibit vomiting, 
um, or bind up, um, uh, that's what I'm looking for, um, they'll, they'll alter the bitter taste of foods uh, to make them palatable. And examples, um, people, cultures, traditional cultures throughout the world have used um, geophagy to, to improve the taste of food. So that um, the Andeans in um, Peru, the um, Native Americans, with the wild potato, they dipped it in um, a clay slurry solution and then ate the potato and it, um, and it tasted better. Um, the Hopi Indians in southwest of the United States um, used acorn and mixed it with clay to then make a bread. And Sardinians um, off the coast of Italy um, did a similar sort of thing. So it's a, it's a universal practice that's been adopted uh, to make food more palatable. Now, this is the potato. Um, and I'm showing here two examples of what we call the Māori potato. Um, and it's uh, very similar to the natural potato form, uh, which comes from the Peruvian area in South America. And um, there is the original site of the wild potato. And uh, there's an example of the wild potatoes there. They're actually toxic. They're, um, they're very bitter. Uh, they cause vomiting. And the Andeans uh, learned to, to either cut them up and lay them out in the evening so that they would be frosted. So there's your freeze drying. <clears throat> and then they would um, boil them and eat them. And that made them safe to eat. The other way that people have dealt with these foods is through domestication. And through domestication, they selected plants that were perhaps a little less bitter. Uh, tubers are a little less bitter, and they, um, they decided to replant those. And then they selected for the less bitter ones um, over a period of time until we now have potatoes that don't taste bitter when we eat them. Potatoes do still have toxin in them. And I have read that um, you would have to eat eight kilos of potatoes in one sitting to, for them to have any effect. But I suspect that um, you would feel worse from eating eight kilos of potatoes um, and probably have to stop before you got through the eight kilos of potatoes. So um, it's unlikely that you would suffer any serious effects. Another one of um, beans, dried beans. Um, they have to be soaked before they are eaten. Now, the beans um, in, um, <clears throat> in South America, they cook them in their clay pots uh, over a fire until they are safe to eat. Now, beans have to be soaked first. And the water of the beans, you never, you never drink that water or you never cook in it. You tip that water off, then boil them and don't use the boiled water either. Um, a lot of our beans now are a lot safer than the original beans because again they have been domesticated and um, have been selected for the beans that are less toxic but they still do contain toxins. Taro. Um, the taro um, tuber itself uh, has to be cooked uh, it contains the raphides, the, the small needle-like structures. It also contains oxalic acid. Um, so taro always has to be cooked before it can be eaten. And the leaves in particular, if you were to eat the leaves, um, you would um, suffer severe burning in your mouth and um, in your throat from the raphides irritating your, the inner lining of your throat. So um, how did people deal with the taro? This is a um, photo taken from the um, Trobriand Islands um, in about 1915 of people preparing taro. And they took the, cut the taro, they, they chopped it up, um, boiled it, and then 
um, mashed it uh, to make these cakes um, and then added it to coconut milk and boiled it again. And that makes a kind of pudding. Um, and that was a common way that, that Polynesians and Melanesians dealt with these foods was by making puddings and adding um, a bit of sugar cane, a bit of arrowroot, um, or um, um, <clears throat> coconut milk, and then baking them to uh, make them taste better. And there's just an example of some ceramic pots um, along the top, again, from the New Guinea area. Uh, men cooking the uh, taro in the coconut milk. Well, I've picked, up the main, uh, picked out on the main staples. Um, of course, another one that, that's used in the Pacific is the green banana, the plantain. That's, um, that's inedible when it's green, um, but when it's cooked, it's delicious. There are a number of, a number of other vegetables uh, that do have uh, some um, <clears throat> toxins in them. And um, personally, as a child, I always thought that Brussels sprouts were poisonous, but my mother keeps saying they weren't, but I'm sure that they were. Um, but there is one green vegetable that we commonly eat that does have um, some toxin in it, and that's spinach. And so if you were to consume large quantities of spinach, you probably need to eat several kilos, which I think could be um, about as difficult as eating eight kilos of potatoes in one sitting. Um, you would suffer the effects of it, but I can assure you children that eating your greens is better for you than, um, than not having greens at all, even Brussels sprouts. So we come, to, um, we come to New Zealand, and you notice that a lot of those vegetables are starchy vegetables. Um, and throughout the world, you, you've got cassava or manioc, um, sweet potato, well sweet potato doesn't have any toxins in it, uh, kumara, but the, um, the potato does and taro does, they're all high starch foods um, and, they, uh, and, and they are the foods that traditional people use as their basis for their diet. So you have lots of carbohydrate, lots of starch and then a little bit of meat on the side or perhaps a little bit of, um, of green vegetable. But it's the starch which gave people energy and made them feel full. So um, when we came to, Māori came to New Zealand, um, they brought the sweet potato with them and they brought the, um, the taro with them, but the climate here was not um, warm enough to grow the taro and yam and kumara all year round, so they had to look for uh, local alternatives in the plant foods here, which could um, help them uh, get that amount of carbohydrate or starch that they needed. And the karaka was one um, vegetable, or one fruit, that um, can be used in that way. And this is, um, I'm sure you all know the karaka, um, and they've got green berries on them, green fruit on them at the moment, but that fruit will turn bright orange. And it was at that stage that Māori knocked them down off the trees and, um, and processed them. Now, karaka is highly poisonous, very, very poisonous. It affects the nervous system. Um, it, anyone who eats the inside of a karaka um, suffers convulsions and, um, and limb distortion. So I do not recommend that anyone practice or experiment with eating karaka berries. So what did the Māori do? This is what the inside of a karaka kernel looks like. It's got the, um, when, they're, when they're ripe, they're orange on the outside and that was peeled off. It was quite soft. Um, there are early European accounts that eating the, um, the outer flesh tasted a bit like eating a bitter apricot. Um, it, the outer flesh is not poisonous. It's only the middle bit which is um, 
inside the nut, which is, um, is poisonous. And not just poisonous to humans, but it's poisonous to birds as well. And the kereru here feeds on the ripe karaka berries, but in its digestive process, it, um, it just consumes the orange flesh on the outside, and then the kernel is passed out whole. Um, and possums, I've noticed that possums eat karaka as well, and they chew around the outside um, and leave the, leave the kernels. It's a shame that they didn't eat the kernels, and <laughs> we might have an instant solution to um, our major pest problem. So this is, um, unfortunately, these are green. Um, they've got fibres on the outside of them when they are ripe, um, but it's this interior bit that um, the Māori used to eat. Now, first of all, they would, um, they would gather all these berries, they would put them on the ground and stomp on them. And what that did was it broke the, the outer surface of the skin. Then they gathered them up in baskets again, and they put them into hangi, and they steamed them for up to a day or even two days. And the effect of the steaming is similar to, um, as I um, talked about before, the um, processing of food by heating. Once they um, had been steamed, they took them out, they put them into baskets again, um, and they put them in water. They steeped them in, in rivers or streams. And they would do that for, some of the accounts say, for up to two weeks. And so again, they used that leaching process um, to actually remove the toxins. Once that was done, they could take them, they could dry them, and then store them in fresh baskets in the storehouses until they actually needed to be eaten. Um, and then they would take them out and um, just break that outer, outer kernel and make a meal or a cake, like a cake out of pancakes, out of the, um, this inner in a material, and then it was safe to eat. So it took a lot of processing in order to get um, karaka um, as the right kind of, in the right kind of state that could be eaten safely. Now the other one that we have here um, that was uh, highly desirable was tutu. And um, tutu leaves are poisonous as well. Stock can be poisoned by eating the tutu leaves. But the Māori learned that the berries um, produced this lovely sweet juice and they could extract the juice and drink it and made a nice little jelly-like substance um, and leaving the seeds behind because it's the seeds that are so toxic. And they did this by making baskets um, and Sometimes the baskets were of a very close weave and they would put the, the cut, uh, ripe tutu berries in them and then um, press down and the seeds would be retained in the fine mesh um, and the juice would flow through. Or another way to do it was to, um, uh, this is a, an example of a basket here in our collection. Um, the tutu berries were put inside it along with, um, you can see here, these are the fluffy bits of the toy toy. And the toy toy um, acted as, as a sieve and it retained the seeds, collected the seeds and the liquid flowed through. Um, now this is an example of another form of, um, of sieve and way of bringing the, the the berry juice out. This one um, is actually described as a titoki um, uh, ringer, and it was flax with people holding two ends and twist it and twist it, and then the juice flows through. Well, apparently it was also used for for tutu as well. And here is an example, two examples that we have in our collection of um, baskets with a tutu seeds were put inside it and you can see there's a twist at the end of that one, it's only half a, half a um, container um, <clears throat> and it was twisted in the, in the same form that I just showed you. 
So again, um, tutu, highly poisonous. You've probably heard about toxic um, poisoning from people eating honey that, uh, where the bees have been um, consuming tutu. And again, it causes convulsions and um, makes people um, very, very sick or, um, in some cases, death. So, kids, do not experiment at home with these processes. Now, what's that? Anyone know what they, they are? What are they? Chocolates. Are chocolates poisonous? You sure? Absolutely sure? <laughs> They're poisonous to dogs and to cats. Chocolate is very poisonous to dogs. So what humans can eat, other animals can't eat. And conversely, what other animals can eat, humans can't necessarily eat. But I've eaten a few of them too, so I don't think they're toxic. Not like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> so how did people learn a food was poisonous? They fed new ch small children a food to see what happened. True or false? False. <laughs> Children experimented with eating and parents saw what happened and they learned very quickly from that. I think that's true. It's probably how um, um, traditional societies learned food was poisonous, certain foods were poisonous. Familiarity with plants so that even when new plants were encountered, such as um, Polynesians travelling across the Pacific and landing on um, new islands with new vegetation types they'd never seen before, they could recognise plants as being dangerous and they often um, transferred names from one island group to another of um, it was slightly different the plant um, and, and in one group was poisonous and they gave it a name when they went to another island group um, or another island and they found different vegetation but it looked similar, um, it had a slight bitterness to the fruit, they might give it the same name. And that's that transference of name um, to make people remember um, that food is, um, certain foods are dangerous. Um, and the, another way of doing it is a cultural memory transmitted through traditions or handed down from mother to daughter. And I say mother to daughter because it was the women who did the foraging for food. Um, men were the hunters. They brought back the meat, but the women um, provided the staples. They went out looking for the roots and the tubers, um, and they also uh, did the gardening. And, um, and, and another way of doing it is, is by assigning a name and having a name that signifies that um, that food is poisonous. And uh, for example, the deadly nightshade, and another one is the death cap for, um, mushroom. Well, I know what Māori used to, um, if, if someone started suffering convulsions from eating karaka, um, then they would dig a pit and they would bury them um, with their limbs bound. Um, and the reason for that is uh, that the way it affects the nervous system is that the limbs will distort in all odd directions and, um, and then paralysis, muscle paralysis sets in. So by binding them tightly, um, it stopped that movement of the, of the muscles um, and, and then the burial, of course, um, up to their neck um, uh, also gives that rigidity to the, to the muscles. Like the body thing, isn't it? Yes. And then um, apparently someone would just um, um, try to feed them as much um, water, fresh water, as possible to try and flush the toxins out. I guess the first, um, the first step, if, if you know of anyone who has in take, eaten karaka berries, is ring the poison centre. Now, in the advertising blurb, it said that I was going to tell you about what killed our mummy, Tarsijima. And... Um, she didn't eat a poisonous food, <clears throat> but um, her food, in a way, did contribute to her death. She's from the Delta region in Egypt. She was about 32, um, so she wasn't she wasn't a high class people like we associate mummies with the with the pharaohs and and the um, the pyramids. But a lot of people were mummified um, as a means of of preserving them for the afterlife. 
um, mommy a few years ago was looking in rather poor condition <clears throat> and um, so she had to have some major conservation work. And they took the opportunity at that time to um, open up the sarcophagus and to um, uh, get a CT scan done of the mummy. Uh, this is what the inside of the, the base of the mummy case with writing on it, so that's how um, we know what her name is. And, um, and then she was prepared, taken out of the case and still wrapped in, in all of the wrappings was um, taken to the Mercy Hospital and had a CT scan. And um, uh, with quite uh, remarkable results that they were able to, to um, a pathologist to look at her overall health and, um, um, <clears throat> and find out what killed her. Um, so this is the, the wrappings um, over the mummy's head and then the CT scan um, showing her organs inside and her skeletal structure. And um, very uh, uh, close uh, um, imaging of her teeth shows that um, she was missing a premolar on her right side and she was missing a molar on her upper left side um, with a large hole in the jaw behind it. And um, the conclusion was that the mummy had um, bad teeth thought caused by uh, the diet that she was eating. The grains probably had a lot of husks in them. Um, the bread may have had a lot of husks, may have had small stones in it, um, which wore down the teeth. And um, so that causes dental caries once the enamel is broken. Um, infection gets in, then it caused an abscess. Um, and I think the pathologist said that she had a um, separate, separating abscess. Yes, that's right. Yes, so it probably had pus and all sorts of things coming out of it. And it also got into her bloodstream and caused blood poisoning, organ failure, and that was, um, and our mummy died. Um, so the moral of that story is to... Um, clean your teeth and don't eat stones in your food. And that's another, um, another image of her showing that um, missing molar on that side um, and the damage that's up in the upper jaw. Yes, I think it, I think it would have been that blood poisoning um, occurs very rapidly and, and spreads through the body very rapidly as well. Um, and, and does affect the organs quite cl quickly. It would have affected her heart and her liver um, and, um, and just generally shut down, the system shut down. I'm sure you've all enjoyed this presentation today. I know I've learned a lot and um, I'll be taking away that knowledge with me so we could all share our appreciation with that for the weeks.